thank you for tuning in. Welcome to a new episode of the Passion for Technology podcast by EBB Electronic. Welcome to the Passion for Technology podcast, an independent factory producing even the smallest batch sizes without human assistance, operating 24-7 and doing so more efficiently and at significantly lower unit costs than before. This is the vision of autonomous production. But how close is the industry to realizing this vision today? And what exactly is required to make this vision a reality? Our guests today are Professor Dr. Jürgen Jasperneite, who is a director at the Fraunhofer Institute in Lemgo. Hi, Jürgen. Hi. And Arndt Geisler, Regional Application Manager at EBV Electronik. Hi, Arndt. Yes, hello. Jürgen, how do you define autonomous production? What should autonomous production be able to do to qualify as such? Yeah, okay. I think, uh, first of all, it makes sense that we define the term autonomy. In my understanding, the autonomy of a technical system is the ability to carry out things independently on the basis of self-learned knowledge that have not been programmed in advance. Depending on the degree of autonomy, this can range from assisting humans in the production environment until acting completely independently. I think in terms of production, this can include activities such as autonomous configuration, which we also call self-configuration, self-optimization, self-diagnosis, self-healing of subsystems or entire systems, or also the entire field of production planning. For me, it is more or less everything around the self-ex capabilities of a technical system. Autonomous systems and subsystems are able to act independently and make decisions according to the requirements placed on them and fulfill tasks. This maybe is my attempt to define autonomous production. And Arndt, what would you say? How much autonomy can a production plant handle? Is there truly no longer a need for humans in the factory of the future if, you know, if autonomy manifests as Jürgen described it? Well, um, looking at uh, like black and white, I think completely autonomous production should function without intervention and help of humans. But consequently, some professions are likely to be replaced by others in the coming years. So there are wide varieties of forecasts as how to and to what extent this will happen. But in general, automation should enable people to deal with higher value tasks such as problem solving or process optimization and Let's say robots can then be used for low-value repetitive tasks. However, there will still be certain automation tasks in the future that cannot be solved so that people and machines will have to collaborate. What does this imply for individuals then, though? I mean, is the traditional industrial worker becoming obsolete? Jürgen, to put it more positively, what qualifications are necessary to work in future factories? I think the classic industrial worker role may evolve in the era of autonomous production because some traditional tasks may be automated, but uh, new opportunities for employment may also arise at the same time. The workers will need to acquire uh, new skills and qualifications to adapt to the changing landscape of autonomous production systems. And this may include uh, skills in operating and maintaining autonomous systems data analysis, programming, and also in collaboration with AI technologies. So I think today profile of the industrial worker will change from doing these repetitive tasks to more a manager or advisor of the autonomous system. And we also have to mention that humans are still far superior to machines in terms of creative thinking and also problem-solving skills so that As much as we all enjoy technology, we shouldn't forget this. And I think all of us know this statement of Elon Musk, who is actually a big fan of automation technology, automated production. In 2018, he admitted that his production problems with his new Model 3 were intensified by excessive use of automation technology. And he confirmed that robots... And the overall complexity of this automated, not autonomous, but highly automated system slowed down the production in some cases and that people were undervalued. So I think this is a quite strong statement from a tech leader. I mean, that's very interesting. Now, now we have a 
first idea of what autonomous production and autonomy in that context looks like. We've touched up on what type of impact it might have on individuals and work in industrial settings. But Ant, what would you say are the key advantages of autonomous production? I think you did already say a lot in the introduction. So it comes to flexible batch sizes, individualization of products, and of course, a high quality level. Also, factories can run 24-7, which has a big impact and big advantage. Jürgen, how can autonomy in manufacturing improve resource efficiency? This question is particularly relevant now, especially with respect to goals for, let's say, energy efficiency. I think this is a really interesting point, but we also do some current projects in this field. And we know that this industrial sector accounted for nearly 30% of Germany's finally energy consumption, at least in 2021. And therefore, we have a great potential in terms of electrical energy savings by intelligent technical systems. So, and uh, we at the Fraunhofer Institute in Lemgo started the project uh, together with partners from building automation and energy providers, which we call the Smart E-Factory, to make our smart factory here on the campus itself a blueprint for a sustainable production environment. And we address the four fields of energy production and consumption, as well as storage and management. And our plan is to gradually develop and deploy fundamental technologies from the field of AI for the optimization of industrial plants in combination with regenerative energy generation as part of a holistic or the more holistic intelligent energy management. So I think that autonomy or, um, let's say, more cognitive system can improve resource efficiency on a very high level. And in your role at EBV Electronic, you have a very broad perspective. Would you say that autonomous production is a viable option for all kinds of manufacturing companies, or is it particularly beneficial for certain types of companies? Yeah, that's a good question. When it comes to EBV and our task to distribute semiconductors, of course, our customers are mainly in the field of PCB construction. And so you have to place the parts on a PCB, and that is already very autonomous. So you have the robots which place the parts on the PCB. You have certain AI systems, vision systems who control this process if everything is in line. But as you mentioned, of course, if you look at larger scale manufacturing like Tesla was mentioned or automotive industries, you already see also a lot of autonomous tasks there. So I would say in the long run, probably yes. But currently, I would say that the production task complexity needs to be scaled down to optimize processes. So you need to lower the complexity in order to make it more autonomous. So also the use of cobots, so the collaboration between machine and man, is a way or the road to autonomous production. Jürgen, being an expert in the field and having been with the field for a long time, do you see risks in connection with autonomous production? And if so, how can these be reduced? Of course, autonomous production as well as highly automated production system does come with risk that need to be addressed. This is uh, in the field of technological failures or malfunctions can disrupt operations, lead to production downtime, all the things which can happen if I have a technical system for performing the production tasks. But there are also concerns about the cybersecurity because we think that autonomous systems are highly connected to networks, uh, not only locally, but also with cloud systems, with other partners, value partners, but also with other production size and therefore vulnerable to attacks. Additionally, there may be also concerns about job displacements as every automation systems and the impact on the workforce itself. So, and I think this risk can be reduced through proper planning, of course, risk assessment, redundancy measures to prevent shutdown situations, considering cybersecurity, and of course, training programs for workers, because I don't see an autonomous production system as a dark production, a production where we don't have any humans. I think also that autonomous production will have some humans to maintain and operate the system. So to sum it up, the risk can be reduced if we don't have a too excessive or unrealistic expectation of what is technical possible and sensible. Jürgen, if we focus a little more on the technology, let's explore that a bit. What is required to implement autonomous production? 
to realize an autonomous factory, I think we need the following technologies in addition to the state-of-the-art automation technologies. First of all, it is everything about AI to enable the learning and cognitive processing of information at all levels of the subsystems and the systems. And this is not only at this higher production planning and scheduling level, but sometimes also down to the sensor level where we can add AI to get better observing of the technical process. At the processing level, we get more cognitive real-time processing and so on. The second field is that we need this so-called digital twin so that we have a machine processable world model. Otherwise, the computer cannot do anything useful. And the third point is that we need the Internet of Things technologies, especially for connecting to cloud and edge computing paradigms. And I think last but not least, also cognitive robotics. Not the robotics, what we see today, but cognitive robotics, which are able to be introduced to tasks very easily, much more easily than today. And where these robots are themselves able to adapt to the requirements of the assigned task. These are the four, I think, key technologies we need to realize an autonomous production system. And would you say that all of these technologies are readily available today? Where do you see room for continued development? Yeah, I personally think that most of the technologies are there and available, but also constantly being optimized in order to meet the targets, so to say, or to be more flexible, to be better. So, but I think when it comes to the brain, so processing, we always see that the development is going further and further. So the processors are getting smaller, they're getting less power consumption with the same computing power. So you have to really see what tasks you can give each processor and the tasks are getting more complex, so you need more calculating power. But also we see that our semiconductor suppliers, they introduce the so-called NPUs, so neural processing units, in the processor itself so they can work better on tasks for AI algorithms. We have human-machine interfaces in place. We have technologies for AI data bandwidth communication. We see new technologies coming up like single pair Ethernet to be, let's say, more optimized with wires and stuff like that. What Jürgen said is very important. I personally think is all about the topic security. This is getting more and more important. Also with the Cyber Resilience Act we are facing, I think, in 2024, which will be then in place. And here we have suppliers having like trusted platform modules or secure elements in place to protect or to enable secure boot stuff. And at the end, of course, software puts everything together. And here I think the biggest task is really to have the right interfaces and the right interoperability. And I think this is one of the main tasks on the factory floor to bring everything together. Maybe I also can add another point. I think there's also a lack of an industry-wide accepted system architecture for the autonomous factory, because I think there's now a single picture of an autonomous factory, which is widely accepted by all the stakeholders up to now. And above all, we need what you also mentioned, this semantic interoperability between all the involved subsystems and systems. And this is, I think, very important due to the fact that we must know that there is no manufacturer with all the products to make a complete factory. So, however, we have some very promising developments here, such also this standard of this asset administration shell, which tries to bring all the different assets on the different levels of a factory together and to make the communication between all these assets interoperable. I think this is also a key which we have to consider if this idea of an autonomous factory will become real. Both of you have covered a huge bandwidth of different technologies. I find that very exciting. One technology that both of you have also brought up is, and a couple of times now, is AI. Jürgen, I'd like to understand better what role AI has to play in this context. 
Yeah, from my point of view, AI plays a crucial role in autonomous production because the basic idea is to create systems which are acting autonomously and without the human intervention. For this, we must enable machines and systems to learn from data, make decisions or prepare decisions at least, and adapt to changing circumstances. Uh, this is only possible with AI and AI algorithms, thanks to the computing power, can analyze large amounts of data in real time, identify structures and patterns and anomalies, and also is able to optimize production processes accordingly. So in, therefore, AI can enable tasks in the production systems like predictive maintenance where machines can detect potential issues and also schedule maintenance proactively, minimizing downtime and optimizing also the allocation of resources. Therefore, AI play a very important role in this vision of an autonomous production. And Ant, how are semiconductor manufacturers responding to the trend towards autonomy in industrial production? Is this a potential market for them? Oh, yes, it is. And it's a big market for them, of course. So as pointed out before, when you look at a microprocessor today and like five or 10 years ago, we see a multi-core architectures. We see the so-called NPU, the neural processing unit included. And that is, of course, like all suppliers do this in some way. We see that the process technologies are getting smaller and smaller. So if you look at FPGA technology, we are talking about seven nanometer processes in the meantime. So this is also getting up the processing power, the complexity of the chip, but um, having the power in place. But also, I think what's very important is what Jürgen mentioned before, is also to have calculating power or processing power at the edge. So we don't want to communicate large data to the cloud, have a decision there and get the feedback here. So we want to take the decision where the manufacturing takes place. And here also we see sensor suppliers, including some, let's say, AI algorithms to already decide in the sensor if something goes right or goes wrong. And of course, when it comes to monitoring features, we have safety features built in, like built-in self-tests and everything to really have a safe part and be able to get the system in a safe state when something goes wrong. So all this goes in direction to have the autonomy in industrial production. Essentially, we're talking about distributed systems with components and microprocessors, either in the cloud or at the edge or both of that. But that's the microprocessor and semiconductor side. If we look at those different systems, and they can actually only operate autonomously if they share a common data pool. They have to operate on some data, right? Our component and system suppliers, as well as plant operators, are they ready for such cross-company data pooling? And what would you say? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges, like bringing everything together. As stated before, we as EBV are interested to do not only component level consultation, but also look at system integration with a scope of interoperability. But I think the smart factory OWL is a great approach to address these challenges on the factory floor and bring together all topics. Jürgen, do you have something to add to that? Yes, I also want to support the need of this interoperability, as I mentioned before, and I think the good news is that in this context, uh, that we have some progress in this field in the developments of standardized data spaces, which maybe should be mentioned here. For example, the uh, German initiative Manufacturing X, in which companies should be able to confidentially and share data across the entire manufacturing and also the supply chain. This is a very huge public uh, funded project in Germany where we also are a part of. And the other one, on the European level, it is called Gaia-X, which is a project to build a high-performance and competitive and a secure mm -hmm. and trustworthy data infrastructure according to European values and standards, so that we are not depending purely on the strategies of the hyperscaler, which we know from the US. 
I think these are very important initiatives to create a trustworthy infrastructure so that companies really can exchange data in an interoperable but also secure way. Jürgen, setting our sights beyond the immediate future, how much autonomy do you expect to exist in the industry, let's say not five or ten years from now, but in 25 years from now? Yes, it's a very difficult task to predict the exact level of autonomy in industry 25 years from now. But I think that we can expect that the industry will become more automated and that we also see at the same time more and more this self-X properties in different forms at the different levels of a factory. That means the self-configuration of systems. If we have the need to reorganize a production system, then we will see that there will be built-in self-configuration mechanism, mechanisms so that it becomes much more easier and faster to reconfigure a system from one configuration to the other. Or also the self-diagnosis on self-healing things. And this, as I mentioned before, at the different levels of a factory and also this Advancements in AI and robotics, I think autonomous systems will continue to improve in their capabilities and become more prevalent in various industries. But uh, we should also consider that the level of autonomy will depend on factors such as the regulatory frameworks, of course, a technology or technological advancement, but also by the societal acceptance and last but not least, also the economic factors. Because I think it's quite costly to realize an autonomous production system and it must also fit to the products of the manufacturing company. So it, I think that it's likely that industries will increasingly leverage autonomous production capabilities to enhance efficiency, sustainability and also competitiveness. And would you also dare to venture a look into the future? Yeah, well, I can dare, but also I think, uh, of course, the level of autonomy will dramatically increase. And also you will see areas which you don't think that it's capable now will start being part of the autonomous production. But I think 25 years is, is very far out and there's a lot of topics to be solved. I think even, as I said, Technology-wise, I think we have a lot in place already, but the main task is standardization, interoperability, and to deal with the data and information we have already available. Now, Jürgen, it's tradition for our podcast, Passion for Technology, to ask our guests about their passion for technology and the origins of their passion for technology. So what about you? You've become a professor in this field. Where did your origins or what did your origins for your passion look like? Well, um, it's like many people of my generation at a time when there was no internet. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? My passion for technology uh, dates back to my uh, youth where I always was very interested in science and technology. And I got involved with electronics very early on and later also with upcoming PC technology and software development. And I also was, in my early days, I was a radio amateur and built a lot of electronical equipment by myself and I've always been convinced that technology is a very important tool for being able to address also big questions of our time and such as now the energy transition, climate crisis or generally speaking many of the United Nations sustainability goals and this is what I now try to pass on to the students. And how about yourself? I mean we've heard from Jürgen and from many of our other guests that their careers started with initial hardware and software tinkering. How about you? Well, when I look back, uh, when I was a kid, it was more like hardware, you know, the Lego and Fisher Technic thing, where you start your skills uh, building some machines or some equipment. But later, it was like the Cosmos parts, where you can build up radios and to understand the easy electronic circuits and get a motor to spin. And this led me really to the electronic engineering studies. And here I also looked into the radio and, uh, of course, as a student, we built our PCs on our own and had the main boards. And we had in our department several people and we used 
the coax cables to have internet in the uh, room. So so that was um, yeah uh, the following the path on private projects, so to say. Yeah, very relatable. I remember very vividly. Remember the coax cables and the token ring networks and the terminators you needed to have. There's a lot of nodding going on around the table. Well, thank you, Jürgen, and thank you, Ant, for the insights that you've shared with us today. Dear listeners, as always, you can find more info in our show notes. Please feel free to subscribe to our podcast, Passion for Technology, on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of the other popular podcasting platforms. Jürgen, Ant, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.